paper, I will try to propose an interpretation of Euripides' Iphigenia in Taurus. And I would like to begin this paper with a short discussion of what I mean by an interpretation and uh, a brief sketch of a uh, history of my approach to uh, the interpretation of Euripides. I believe that Euripidean tragedy car uh, carries a certain meaning. Uh, this meaning was deliberately put into the text by its author. So I am very conservative in terms of uh, literary criticism because now lots of my colleagues uh, they think that it's uh, mm, uh, it it isn't a good thing to try to find a, a, an author's I uh, intention uh, in an, in an artistic work. Uh, the entire tragedy was permitted with this meaning and served as its artistic embodiment. To provide an interpretation of a dramatic work is then to discover such a meaning capable of explaining the whole multitude of its details. The methodology of discovering the play's meaning follows from my general uh, view of Euripides' dramatic technique that I developed uh, in my book, uh, Misery and Forgiveness in Euripides, Theme and Structure in Hippolytus, that was published in uh, 2015 by the Classical Press of Wales. I suppose that Euripides' tragedies have a well thought out uniform integral structure. But the integrity of Euripides' plays is created above all not by unity of linear action, and not by unit of character. And this is just the thing where uh, most scholars try to find the integrity and they don't find it. Uh, so the integrity of Euripides' place is uh, rather created by echoing between various dramatic events and situations linked with one another by relations of similarity or contrast. Thus, it is the study of repeated elements of a drama and of the relations of similarity and contrast, which proves to be the most essential to understanding its architectonics. For convenience of working with such elements, I use the concepts of motif or theme, which I understand to mean any repeating element having meaning. There may be quite a few such themes in a single tragedy. However, a, a dominant meaning that is, the theme for the sake of which the drama has been created can be singled out in any drama. All other themes will be subordinate or auxiliary. They are logically linked to the dominant meaning and serve to reveal or emphasize it. In my new book that I almost finished and uh, uh, that is now in print uh, by Lyon University Press. I try to show that, at least in some of Euripides' tragedies, the structural unity and the dominant theme can be explained only by a hypothesis of their link with specific political events. Uh, and now I will say some general words about the history of such political interpretation of Euripides' tragedies. All these words are preliminary to the interpretation of Iphigenia that I'm going to propose. Almost all Greek tragedies have for subjects mythological stories, whose action takes place in a time considered by the spectators as distant and belonging to a legendary past. But critics, especially those of the 19th century and of the first half of the 20th century, have tended to look for allusions to real historical events contemporary with the writing and performance of these plays. These critics had neither precise methodology nor rigorous criteria that could have allowed them to prove the existence of such allusions. Generally, it was enough for them to find even a slight analogy between events recounted, recounted on stage and historical facts to consider that the poet was referring in his play to a contemporary reality. The objections to such approach 
were very strong. Is a simple resemblance between the subject of a tragedy and historical events sufficient to conclude that it is a deliberate illusion? This approach is all the more questionable since our notions of the 5th century history are rather superficial. Many details are unknown to us and we can easily see similarities where in reality the disparities are considerable. In the second half of the 20th century, critics almost entirely abandoned the, this vain search for such illusions and became interested instead in studying the artistic structure of the tragedies and in finding a universal, not historical and singular human meaning. And history became interesting not as a key to deciphering allegorical meanings, but as a backdrop against which the tragedies had been created and hosted and which must have influenced their general climate. By the end of the 20th century, scholars were interested in what the tragedies referred to in the social and political representations of the time, such things as democratic ideology and its critics, gender relations, class relations, etc., and uh, this trend, uh, this approach, uh, has been called uh, new historicism in contrast to that old historicism, old uh, uh, manner of finding allusions to concrete political events. Only the few works uh, continued to follow the old approach and correlate tragedies with historical events and characters, such as, for example, Podletsky's The Political Background of a Skyland Tragedy. And all these, words, all these works were met with strong criticism. Many of them deserved this severe criticism, as, for example, the work of Michael Vikers, who saw allegorical portraits of Alcibiades everywhere in every tragedy and in every comedy in the 5th century. Looking for references in tragedies to events contemporary to their writing has become a sign of bad taste. However, it is quite possible that science, by refuting speculative and often aberrant parallels between plays and historical realities, and eventually rejecting the idea of a direct link be between them altogether has thrown the baby out with the bath water. One of the main flaws of old historicism, which led to many aberrant interpretations and conclusions, and eventually became the cause of negative scholarly judgment for any historicist approach at all, was a blatant inattention to the aesthetic construction of the tragedies, to the structure of the tragedies. The desire to find an illusion was stronger than the desire to understand the internal dramatic logic of the work. In my work, on the contrary, I begin my research with a detailed analysis of the structure of the tragedy, studying the play as such. And only then do I move on to analyze the historical references it contains or it might contain. So in this paper, I will propose a thematic analysis of Iphigenia in Taurus. I will try to show that it is a political theme that serves as the dominant theme in this play. We can suppose that Iphigenia is related to a particular political context. It is a reaction to such a context, and it conveys a certain very concrete political message. To understand the meaning put by Euripides into the story of the adventures of Orestes and Iphigenia, we should begin with a detailed analysis of all the motives or themes constituting the thematic structure of the tragedy. And so now uh, we will begin this journey through the thematic structure of Iphigenia uh, with its first theme, uh, the contrast between bar uh, barbarism and Hellenism. It is certainly the most evident of all motives of this drama. 
The motive of barbarism manifests itself already at the very beginning of the play, in the prologue, where Iphigenia tells about how Artemis transferred her from the altar in Olis to the land of the Taurians. Hugesa nasi barbaroisi barbaros toas, where bar barbarian rules the uh, where a barbarian rules the land of barbarians, uh, Thoas. Lines 31-32. Now uh, you can uh, look uh, at uh, the examples uh, in your papers. Also named here is the main feature of that land, the custom of sacrificing any Helen who comes to this land. Tu ogar ontos tu no mu kai prin polei, gosan katelte ten de gen helen aner. I sacrifice by custom of the city established earlier any Helen who comes to this land. Lines 38 39. Further on, we also constantly come across an antithesis between the barbarian land and Hellas and every comment on the barbarism of the Turians is accompanied with words about this custom. So this custom, this custom of sacrificing uh, Greeks, is the main feature of the barbarian character of these barbarians. Uh, in the Paradise, Iphigenia bewails her bitter fate of living in an unfertile home on this sea that is hostile to strangers, and of pouring on the altars the blood of Greeks who wail a piteous cry and weep piteous tears. In the first Stesimon, the chorus, having just learned of the capture of two Greek youths who found themselves in the land of the Taurians, wonder who they are who left beautiful Hellas to come to the unsociable land, where the blood of mortals stains the, uh, the altars and columned temples. They have come here, they have come to, this, to the unsociable land, where for the divine maiden, the blood of mortals stains the altars and columned temples. When in the second testament the Hellenic girls comprising the chorus tell about their misfortunes, about how they were taken captives and sold to the barbarian land, and through gold rich trading I went on a barbarian journey, they once again name human sacrifice, in which they are forced to participate as the main feature of that land. Paid Agamemnonian latreu wo bo mus tu melutas. I wait upon Agamemnonian child and on altars where no sheep is uh, are sacrificed. However, this antithesis between the barbarian world... So, now, uh, I don't know, I think that I can do without writing, but uh, we, we should remember, yes, that uh, there, there is a certain contrast between the barbarian land and uh, the Greek world, uh, and, uh, and civilization, we shouldn't now call it Greek world. And uh, the main feature of the barbarians are human sacrifices, the sacrifices of the Greeks. However, this antithesis between the barbarian world and the Hellenic world is not so straightforward. In Hellas itself, in the family of Iphigenia and Orestes, there occurred events which are from the very beginning of the tragedy compared and correlated with the barbarian customs of the land of the Turians. And so now we pass to the second theme, to the second number uh, in your papers. The prologue of the tragedy 
begins with the story of how Iphigenia had to be sacrificed by her father to appease Artemis so that the Achaean ships would <coughs> sail to Troy. A detailed description of all the circumstances of this sacrifice takes up nearly half of her monologue. And then the heroine tells about her subsequent destiny, about how, saved by Artemis, she has to participate in human sacrifice to this goddess in the land of the Torrents. This juxtaposition of the stories about the two impure rituals makes one think about similarity between them. And this similarity is emphasized by the coincidence of details. In both cases, the sacrifice is offered to Artemis. And in both cases, the same word, Svadzein, is used with reference to the sacrifice. In addition to the report of Iphigenia's death at the hand of her father, the heroine's introductory monologue contains a circumstantial mention of several other murders in her family committed by her close relatives. Let's look at the beginning of her monologue. She begins her speech with listing her ancestors. Pelops Hokan Hotan Taleios Eis Pisan Molon Toaisin Hippois Oinomau Gamei Koren Exhes Atreos Eblasten Atreos de Pais Menelaus Sagamemnonte to the Funego Testun Dareia Stugatros Iphigenia Pais Pelops, son of Tantalus, coming to Pisa with swift horses, married Oinomau's daughter. And she gave birth to uh, Atreus, whose children are Menelaus and Agamemnon. From him I was born, his child Iphigenia, by the daughter of Tindareus. In the spectators' minds, the names of nearly all the characters named here are associated with murders. And all these murders will be told about further in the tragedy. <coughs> Tantalus, as we know, killed his own son Pelops and served his flesh in a stew to the feasting gods. Iphigenia would later on compare this story with the sacrifices in the land of the Torrents when she will reject the idea that both cases of sacrifice are in a similar fashion demanded by gods. It's in the next example. Egomenun tantan talute oisi hestiamata apista crino paidus restenai boratus dentat autus ontus antropoctonus estente onto faulion anaferendo co. Pelops, in his turn, took Hippodemia, the daughter of King Oinomaus of Pisa, as his wife, having not only won chariot races with him, but also having killed him. This myth would play a major part in the scene of recognition of Orestes and Iphigenia, the last object, the knowledge of which would make Iphigenia believe that she was seeing her brother Orestes was an old spear of Pelops that served as an instrument of murder and was hung up in her rooms in Argos. Finally, Atreus, arguing with his brother Theestes over the golden fleeced sheep, a symbol of royal power in Argos, killed his sons and offered their flesh to Theestes at a feast, then horrified the sun itself ran backward in its course. The chorus recalls the golden lamb in the Paradis, tracing to it the misfortunes in the royal house in Argos. Here also mention is made of the change in the motion of the sun. Both these stories are featured in the embroidered fabrics which are kept in Argos and about which Iphigenia asks Orestes, testing him in the scene of recognition. So, as early as the prologue, Iphigenia's sacrifice is compared with the sacrifices in the land of the Torrents, and at the same time, it is inscribed in the series of murders in Tantalus' family. 
The second part of the prologue, containing a conversation between Orestes and Pylades, adds to this series another two murders, which are also compared with the barbarian ritual in the land of the Torrents. Appearing on the stage in front of the temple of Artemis, Orestes and Pylades, uh, in the prologus, uh, in, in the prologus, are examining the building of the temple and the altar bearing traces of the impure ritual. Orestes says, Kaibomos helen hu phonos, and Pylades answers, Exhaimaton gun xante hei And the altar, down on which Greek blood drips, well, it has tawny hair-like strands from blood. And in the verses following this passage, Orestes addresses a bitter reproach to Apollo, who has sent him to this gloomy place so that he could cleanse himself from the murder of his mother and escape from the Irenaeus pursuing him. Here Orestes recalls both his own deed and his father, who fell at the hand of Clytemnestra. O foibe poi mauten de sarcun egages, chresas e pei de patros gaime teis amen, metera catactas. O foibus, whither have you brought me again into this snare by prophesizing, since I avenged my father's blood by killing my mother? Between the description of the barbarian sacrifices and the account of murders in Argos, here, occurs similarity based on the repetition also on the, of the key word haima, blood, ex haimatos in verse 73 and haima in verse 78. These correlated motives of a barbarian ritual and murders in the Argive royal family are brought together in a new murder that is being prepared. That is the murder of Orestes by Iphigenia, the movement towards which determines the entire action of the first half of the tragedy. On the one hand, it is to become still another point, the last one in a number of murders committed by close relatives in the Argos royal family. So it's the last murder in this series of uh, Hegememnon killing uh, Clutaimnestra, Orestes killing, uh, oh, Clutaimnestra killing Agamemnon, Orestes killing Clutaimnestra, and so on. Uh, but at the same time, it is being prepared as a ritual sacrifice to Artemis in the barbarian land of the Torrents. Orestes and Pylades were seized by the shepherds in order to be sacrificed to Artemis according to a local barbarian custom. Edoxe terante te teosphagia tapichoria. It seemed right to hunt for the goddess, the victim's customary in our country. And it is the ruler of this barbarian land, Anacta Tesdeges, who sent them to Iphigenia to be slaughtered, as Hernibas de Caesphagi epem pesoi. So it is described as one of the examples of this barbarian ritual. But at the same time, the forthcoming murder of Orestes is brought together with other scenes of blood spilling in his family. In the first place, it is compared with the murder of Iphigenia in Aulis. The correlation between the sacrifices of Orestes S. and Iphigenia is particularly evident in the lyrical dialogue Amoibayon between these two characters after the scene of recognition. This dialogue opens with the words of Orestes identifying its main theme. Geneimen eutu humen as the soon for us, usungon gemon justu has a few bios. Lines uh, 850-851. We are fortunate in our family, but in our circumstances, my sister, we were born to be unfortunate in life. 
and out of all the misfortunes suffered by the family, only two are discussed further on. And these two are Iphigenia's death in Aulis and the murder of Orestes, which she nearly committed here in the land of the Torrents. And moreover, the words used to describe these two misfortunes are chosen so as to emphasize similarity between them. Recalling the events in Aulis, Iphigenia is exclaims, uh, line 8, 161. Feu Oh, the libations there. <coughs> Speaking about the libations there, Hernibon ton eke, that is about the cleansing which started her slaughter, the heroine implicitly compares them with the part of the ritual of sacrifice which she's, her, she's performing here herself, here in the land of the Torrents and which she was going to perform on Orestes. In fact, uh, the word hernibus constantly appears in the play in this meaning, and each time with respect to the sacrifice of Orestes. There are at least uh, five examples. Orestes replies to Iphigenia's regret about the libations in Aulis with a bitter exclamation, exclamation I too cry on me for the deed of daring that our father dared. 862. And a few verses later, Iphigenia repeats these same words, Tolma and Tlene, now meaning her own intention to kill Orestes. O melea dei nas tolmas, dei netlan, dei netlan, O my son Gone, O miserable I for my terrible daring, I steeled myself for terrible things. Ah, me, I steeled myself for terrible things, brother. Lines 869, 870. A little earlier, Aristus used the expression Dei na Tlene in the same meaning when he asked Iphigenia who would sacrifice him and thus commit a horrible murder, uh, line 617, to say that who will sacrifice me and dare the terrible deed? The question to which Iphigenia replied, I will, ego, 618. Moreover, the same words, Deina and Tlene, are applied in the tragedy with respect to other murders in Agamemnon's family. For example, in his first dialogue with Iphigenia, before the recognition, Orestes says, uh, says to her about the murder of his father by his mother. He was dreadfully murdered by his wife, line 553. And Iphigenia uses the same words when she asks Orestes about the murder of his mother that he committed. <coughs> but how did you dare that dreadful deed with our mother? Line 924. Thus, I'm just resuming all that I have said. The main motive of the tragedy, the motive of barbarian human sacrifices, is constantly associated with intrafamilial murders in the house of Agamemnon. And the sacrifice of Orestes by Iphigenia is to join together the barbarian ritual and the tribulations of the Argive royal dynasty. The problem of human sacrifices in the barbarian land is in itself hardly of interest to Euripides, or was in itself hardly of interest to Euripides. Um, I don't think that he was so much excited uh, with the problem of uh, uh, ethnography, uh, particularly in the world that was mostly uh, ima imaginary. So, their constant comparison and drawing together with the events in Agamemnon's family enables us to assume that this motive serves 
for symbolic expression of internal discords in the Hellenic world itself. The metaphorical representations of murders in Atreus' family as impure sacrifices is reminiscent of one of the main persistent images of Aeschylus' Oresteia. <coughs> Starting from the death of Iphigenia and Theestes' feast, which were sacrifices in the direct sense of the word, Aeschylus applies the image of a ritual act to other events as well, to the murder of Agamemnon by uh, Clytemnestra in Agamemnon, lines uh, 1117, 18, and uh, 1433, and also to the death of Clytemnestra and the hands, at the hands of Orestes in the Koeforoi, line uh, 904. And finally, in the Eumenides, it is Orestes himself who turns out to be the victim, a victim dedicated to the Irinus. The Irinus compare him to an animal fattened and consec uh, consecrated to them. Emoi trafeis te katie romenos, line 304. And they speak of him as a proper expiation for his mother's blood. Matron ragnisma curion fonu. And also they refer him as tetumenos, tetumenos, as sacrificial victim, line 328. At the very end of the trilogy, however, the Irinas abandon human sacrifice. They replace it with a pure and sacred sacrifice which the goddess Athena invites them to receive. So Euripides uses the image of human sacrifice in the same sense as Aeschylus. The human sacrifices in the Torian land become a symbol of murders in Atreus family. The part of the Irinus, who at first demanded a human sacrifice but then went through a transformation, contenting themselves with the right and pure sacrifice, is, placed, uh, is played now by Artemis. But preserving Aeschylus' image, Euripides adds a substantial feature, the mode of Bar barbarianism to it. In his case, human sacrifices are not just a distortion and perversion of a festive ritual, the way uh, they are in the case of Iskaios. They get a special geographic expression, being related to the land of the Torrents. And now we will look how this geographical motive, this geographic expression, uh, is developed uh, in, uh, in the other sense as well. And now we pass to the uh, point three about Athens. While the murders in Agamemnon's family, sorry, just one moment. While the murders in Agamemnon's family are associated in Euripides with the barbarian ritual in the end of the Torrents, the deliverance from them is symbolically expressed in Iphigenia's and Orestes' flight from the Torrents. Artemis will be transformed by the spatial transfer of her statue from the barbarian Torrent land, since it is precisely for this reason that the goddess will abandon human sacrifices. Having rescued the statue of Artemis from the land of the Torians, Orestes will rescue both himself and the entire family of Pelops from pursuit by the Irines. Barbarian land, whose main feature is the sacrifice of Helenus, and which symbolically expresses barbarianism in the Greek world itself, namely the murders of one's kith and kin, is opposed to the other spatial pole embodying civilization and peace. 
and this other pole is Athens. Athens and Attica. It is here that the statue and cult of Artemis have to be transferred so that the Argive royal house would be cleansed from murders. The opposition of these two poles, the savage land of the Torrens and the blessed land of Athens is apparent, for example, in the words of prayer, which Iphigenia addresses to Artemis, asking the goddess to help her and Orestes uh, with Pylades to flee. And uh, look, uh, please, at the passage uh, lines 1086-1088. Uh, uh, here, Iphigenia indicates the joy that Artemis will get as a result of her escape. Al eu menesek beti bar baruch tonos estas Atenas, kai garenta du prepei na yein paron soi polinechein eu daimona. But leave this barbarian land for Athens with good will. It is not fitting for you to dwell here when you could have so fortunate a city. Thus, the city of Athens is to be associated with the deliverance of the family of Pelopidas from murder. This association of Athens with the cessation of disasters in the Argive royal family is also stressed by the special role which the goddess Athena, the protectress of the city, plays in the tragedy. She appears at a critical, at a crucial point of action when Poseidon swells the sea and returns to the shore the ship that has just carried away Iphigenia. Iphigenia, Orestes, and Pylades. Uh, and it is just the moment when Thoas, king of the Torrents, is about to catch the runaways. Athena says to Thoas that following her request, Poseidon has stopped the sea swell so that Orestes could sail off to Hellas over the back of the waveless sea. And she orders Thoas to seize the pursuit of Orestes and Iphigenia, and finally, in the last cue of the play, Athena promises to accompany Orestes' ship to Greece, keeping safe the holy image of Artemis. Sum poreo somai de go, so zeus adelfes de semes semnon bretas. I will journey with them and keep safe the holy image of my sister. Now, let us sum up <coughs> our description of the Iphigenia's thematic structure. The liberation from the barbarian land of the Torrents and the deliverance from human sacrifices that they practice symbolically expresses the cessation of intrafamilial murders among the Pelopidas. And a major part in this is played by the city of Athens, where the statue of Artemis and her priestess Iphigenia, uh, as well as the goddess Athena, without whom the escape from the Torrents would be impossible, are to move. The main theme of Iphigenia in Taurus is the deliverance of the family of the Pelopidas from intrafamilial murders. The deliverance sets in through a combination of re uh, resourcefulness and courage of the Pelopidas with the salvatory help of, Ap of Apollo and Athena. And now the question arises, what meaning this theme can carry and why Euripides turns to it? Uh, so now uh, I would propose some further consideration that show the possibility of political interpretation of this play. Uh, and first, let's uh, look at the way how the city of Argos is represented here. Uh, so our attention has to be turned to two major details. Firstly, murders in Agamemnon's family and the family of the Pelopidas are represented not as private disasters of individual people, but as a disease of a royal house in general, and even broader, 
as a misfortune that has befallen the whole of Argos. When at the beginning of the play Iphigenia sees a dream about the death of Orestes, she laments the destiny of the entire house. O case oi koi patro oi, line 153, and also the destiny of Argos. Feu feu ton argei mochton, and the chorus echoes her. Oi moi ton antrei dan oi kon, line 186. Iphigenia and Orestes speak more than once about their house as thrown into confusion. Usum tarachteis oikos, nosunta melatra, nosuntos domus, nosunta oikon, but the care for their house is at the same time care for the whole of Argos. Argos e prasei kalos, she wonders at uh, line uh, 668. That is essential for Euripides to link the events of the tragedy with the destiny of Argus, uh, evidenced by repeated mentioning of the name of the city, 26 times, which is many times more than in other tragedies about the destiny of Agamemnon's family. Only ten times in Electra, twelve times in Orestes, and nine times in Iphigenia in Aulis. Uh, still another fact that has to be taken into account in interpreting Iphigenia in Taurus is the traditional association of murders of close relatives found in the mytho mythological plots of tragedies with a civil war. Such an association can be clearly seen in the work which had a particularly strong effect on the entire thematic structure of Iphigenia, that is, of Iskylos or Estia. In the final scene of the Eumenides, Athena calls on uh, the Erinus not to cast on her real uh, keen incentives to bloodshed and plant in her people the spiral of tribal war. And the goddess wishes the war to be with foreign enemies, but she wants that there will be no battling of birds within the home. And the Irinas agree to Athena's request. Tanda pleston kakon me poten poleistasin I pray that discord, greedy for evil, may never clamor in this city. And these verses are closely linked thematically with the description of Irina's actions in the preceding parts of the trilogy, the representation of their Romanian role in the destiny of the family of Atreus and Agamemnon's family. The word discord, stasis, uttered by the Irinas, which has an apparent political connotation, is more than once applied in the trilogy to the intrafamilial enmity in the house of the uh, Atreides. The murder of Agamemnon was regarded as the overthrow of the lawful power leading to the establishment of tyranny and taking part in all these e e events where the Irinas, who are now in the Eumenides, ready to comply with Athena and no longer sow inner discords in the city, just as they abandon retribution with respect to the members of the Atreides family. So this apparent association of intrafamilial strife and domestic political enmity makes it possible to assume that the former serves as a metaphorical image for the latter. Murders in Atreus' family are an allegory of civil war. Uh, so now let us um, come back to Iphigenia. If we consider that Argus plays a very important part in this play, if we consider that the misfortunes of Orestes and Iphigenia are viewed as the misfortunes of the city, if we keep in mind the traditional association between murders in the family on one hand and civil war on the other hand, 
And finally, if we pay attention to Iphigenia's apparent dependence on the Oresteia, or, 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 Oresteia, where the representation of these murders should have suggested the idea of the strife in Argus, we may propose the following interpretation of Euripides' play. Euripides turns to the theme of civil war in Argus. Apparently, this war should be resolved through, through the in interference of Athens, and it should result in forming an alliance between Argus and Athens. And so now, uh, let's turn to the historical reality. Uh, as for the dating of the tragedy, as far as metrical criteria show, Iphigenia in Taurus was staged in the middle of the 410s BC. The events that took place in Argos at the time enable us to understand the conception of Euripides. In 417 BC, after a nearly half a century of continuous democratic rule and alliance with Athens, there occurred an oligarchic overthrow in Argos. The main source uh, on this overthrow is Thucydides. According to his story, after the defeat of the Argives by the Spartans at the Battle of Mantinea uh, in 418, uh, the pro-Spartan party in Argos forced most citizens into conciliation and then uh, into an alliance with, uh, with Sparta. And then, at the end of the winter of 417 BC, it put down the democracy in Argos. However, a few months later, democracy was restored, and the commons slew some of their opponents and banished others. Whereas Thucydides speaks about the use of violence mainly by the Democrats in restoring democratic rule, other sources tell in detail about the bloody violent actions committed by oligarchs uh, at the time of the overthrow as well. Uh, for example, according to Diodorus of Sicily, uh, who relied on the writing of the 4th century historian Ephorus, uh, and now, uh, now follows uh, the passage that is in your texts, uh, they first of all seized the men who had been accustomed to be the leaders of the people and put them to death, and then by terrorizing the rest of the citizens, they abolished the laws and were proceeding to take the management of the state into their own hands. They maintained this government for eight months and then were overthrown, the people having united against them. And so these men were put to death and the people got back, to, uh, go, uh, got back the democracy. Naturally, Athens supported the Democratic Party. Even before the overthrow, Alcibiades, being present at a meeting in Argos where the question of a truce with the Spartans was being decided, raised objections in an attempt to oppose the Laconophile party. Then, when after their restoration of democracy, the supporters of oligarchy, assisted by Sparta, tried once again to come to power and political opposition continued in the country for a year, the Athenians helped the Democrats in every way. Thus, for example, the Argos Democrats, anticipating a war with Sparta, began to build long walls, reaching out to sea, that could ensure unhindered delivery of supplies from Athens to the city in case of a land war with Sparta. And according to Plutarch, this idea was also advanced by Alcibiades. The Athenians also assisted the Argives the Argives in building the walls, and as reported by Plutarch, Alcibiades himself took part in their construction. And then, in 416 BC, the Athenians, once again headed by Alcibiades, made a raid on Argos and took prisoner 300 of the Argives who were pro Spartan. In 416 BC, an alliance was concluded between Athens and Argos. There has survived an inscription containing the text uh, of the agreement and the information that it was ratified by the Athenians in the prytony of the Aiantis Fule, 
thanks to which we can rather accurately date it. It was in the same pretony that Theseus and Cleomedes uh, raised funds for mounting a campaign against Milas in the spring of 416 BC. Thus, the ratification of the agreement falls on the spring of 416 BC. The hypothesis that the staging of Iphigenia in Taurus was dedicated to the Argus events and the agreement uh, on alliance between Athens and Argus makes it possible to comprehend the organization of the entire thematic structure of the tragedy. The cessation of murders in Agamemnon's family should allegorically mark the end of internecine strife in Argus. The goddess Athena, who helps Arrestes and Iphigenia escape to safety, uh, and the city of Athens, the move to which from the savage land of the Torrents will deliver Iphigenia and Artemis from murders, symbolize the beneficial role which the Athenians have played in the Argus events. By the way, it should be noted that Athena in the play doesn't help any of the sides. No one from Agamemnon's family is found guilty of the murders. All of them are unfortunate victims. The play ends in a triumph of universal peace. Apparently, it was important for Euripides to represent Athens as a peacemaker and not just as an adherent of one of the hostile parties. The assumption of the connection of Iphigenia in Taurus with the civil war in Argos in 417 makes it possible to explain still another detail to which critics have paid insufficient attention. While Athena helps Arrestus and Iphigenia escape, and while the move of the statue of Artemis from the barbarian land of the Torrents to Athens puts an end to the series of murders, it's another city, Sparta, that plays an opposite, ruinous role. Spartans Helen and Menelaus appear to be guilty of creating all the misfortunes suffered by the family of Agamemnon. In the very first verses of the tragedy, Iphigenia names Helen the main cause of her death. It is because of her that Agamemnon has sacrificed his daughter. Line 8. Esfaxen Helenes Hunak was the key pater. The father, as is thought, slaughtered because of Helen. All guilt from Agamemnon is removed. Iphigenia doesn't blame her, her father. She feels as sorry for his destiny as for her own, and it is only evil woman Helen who is found guilty. Uh, look, for example, at the verses 565-66. Uh, Iphigenia says, Talai ne kei ne hok tanon auten pater. And then Orestes, Kakes gunaikes, that is uh, of, of Helen, Harin, Aharin Apoleto. Unhappy girl, and also unhappy the father that killed her. As a thankless favor to an evil woman, she died. Similarly, Clytemnistra who has killed Agamemnon, also gives rise to pity. Look at line 553. O O miserable, the slayer, the she slayer, and uh, the uh, slain. And it is Helen who turns out to be guilty both of this disaster and of the murder of Clytemnestra by Orestes which followed. In reply to Iphigenia's words about the evil role that Helen has, play, has played in her life, to me too she owes a certain grudge from the past, Orestes puts on Helen the blame for his own mis misfortunes as well. I too have gained something from that woman's marriage. Align 526. 
uttered in this context is the name of the city of Sparta, with which the heroine hated by both of Agamemnon's children is associated. Sparte ksunoiki toparos ksuneonete. She lives at Sparta with her former bedfellow. While Helen's flight to Troy may still be regarded as an indirect cause of Orestes' misfortunes, since it led to the sacrifice of Iphigenia, for which Clytemnestra avenged Agamemnon, which in turn led to the murder of Clytemnestra by Orestes. Nevertheless, the statement of Orestes about the harm harmfulness for his family of Helen's return from Troy to Sparta, she has come, it was an unfortunate arrival for one dear to me, in no way corresponds to the logic of the mythological plot. It can only be explained by the author's desire to present this heroine as the cause and beginning of all the woes at all. If we accept this, the assumption about the connection of Iphigenia with the events in Argus, the accusation of Helen for causing Argus' misfortunes becomes clear. The overthrow in the city was effected by the pro-Spartan party with the participation of Sparta. And the Aminius role of Sparta turns out to be opposed by the peacemaking and salutary role of Athens, marked in the tragedy by the participation of the goddess Athena. We can now try more accurately to date Iphigenia in Taurus. So medical considerations show that it should be close in time to the Trojan women, staged in 415. Iphigenia is usually dated by 414. However, its connection to the restoration of democracy in Argos in 417 speaks rather in favor of its dating to 416. And in this case, the staging of, of, of Iphigenia at the festival of great Dionysia in the spring of 416 BC is to coincide with the con just with the conclusion of an alliance between Athens and Argos that same spring. So we might suppose that the production of the play was de de dedicated to this event. During those years, Euripides was very close to Alcibiades. In 416, he wrote an uh, ep uh, epinikion in honor of Alcibiades' victory at the Olympic Games. And in 415, he staged the tragedy The Trojan Women, which might have contained um, a piece of political propaganda for the Sicilian expedition mounted by Alcibiades, but it's another theme. Uh, it may be assumed that turning to Iphigenia turning in Iphigenia to the Argos events and timing his tragedy to coincide with the conclusion of an alliance with Argos, Euripides expressed the political interests of Alcibiades, who, as we have seen, played a very important part in these events. Uh, now just for the conclusion. Uh, the existence of evident thematic links between Iphigenia and Taurus and contemporary political events uh, puts into doubt some presuppositions of modern scholarship. Uh, so, uh, uh, I think that, at least in some cases, we find an actual link between a mythical plot and contemporary events. Uh, not only here, not only in this tragedy. For example, the plot of uh, Aeschylus Eumenides is, is concerned with the institution of Areopagus um, uh, as the court where cases of murder were judged. And we know that in the last years before the production of Eumenides, there was a reform of Areopagus. We can see such kind of links uh, between tragedies and certain political events, in other cases uh, as well. So, uh, generally speaking, uh, the thing that I would like to uh, propose is that, at least in some cases, there can be a very direct uh, relation of a, a piece of a play to uh, 
to a very particular event. Uh, and so we shouldn't uh, uh, discard the possibility of um, such links as is usually now made by uh, the contemporary scholarship. Thank you. Thank you very much.